1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. If you're there in your Bible, that'd be great. You can follow along as I read. This is the Word of God. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. That's our passage for this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder of the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we ask for his help now to understand. May he teach us. Open our eyes to see wonderful things, necessary things in your word. And we ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I don't know if you realize it or not, but we are living in the last days. Now, as I say that, I don't claim to before you to have any particular special prophetic gift per se. But we have been in the last days since Jesus ascended into heaven. And that's when those last days started. The last days are really the period between when Jesus ascends into heaven and when he returns in glory to reclaim his bride, the church. Here in our passage, John uses a phrase which brings even more to mind the eminence, the nearness of the end. He writes at the beginning of verse 18, children, it is the last hour. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but there's a thing called the Doomsday Clock. Have you ever heard of the Doomsday Clock? Yeah. It was uh, founded in 1945. They started to think about it. And it was Albert Einstein and a bunch of his cronies at the University of Chicago. All those guys that were kind of involved in the making of the atomic bomb. And uh, they basically, this bulletin of the atomic scientists created what was now called the Doomsday Clock two years later. And they use the imagery of apocalypse or midnight or countdown to zero. And they convey different threats to humanity and to the planet. It's set every year and it's become universally recognized as an indicator of the, the, the vulnerability of our planet to catastrophe from things like nuclear weapons to climate change and then other disruptive technologies, if I could put it like that. Back in the 1990s, the clock was set at 17 minutes to midnight. Just after Donald Trump's inauguration, <laughs> the clock read that it was 2 minutes 30 seconds to midnight. And in March of this year, a new statement was released in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it currently sits at one minute, 40 seconds to midnight. That's 100 seconds. 
Those scientists want to make it very clear that we're on the brink of global catastrophe. It doesn't particularly feel like a hundred seconds to midnight as we sit out on uh, this lawn here in this beautiful part of the world in the Ottawa Valley. But in their report, they make it clear that they think that we should wake up to the threat that is around us. The clock is ticking. Global catastrophe and danger looms, and it all sounds very alarming indeed. Now, whatever you may make of that, John wants us to have a different ending in mind. It's a glorious hope that he wants us to remember. Verse 17 says, And the world is passing away along with its desires. In other words, we're fools to live for and to love the things of this world. But that when Christ returns, it won't just be an end to this world. It will be a glorious new beginning. So when John writes, children, this is the last hour, he's not a doomsayer on a street corner wearing a placard that says, the end of the world is nigh. He's not writing to alarm us, he's writing to encourage us. And he's wanting us to remember and to understand the times that we are in. This isn't a passage that drips with a, a kind of an anxious foreboding. But it's a passage with a very real and very warm pastoral concern. In our passage this morning, John is going to give us a warning. He's going to give us a reassurance. And then he's going to give us an exhortation. The warning is the Antichrist. Many Antichrists, he says, have come. Then there's going to be a reassurance. An anointing has been given. And then the ex exhortation, namely to abide or to remain in Christ. So that's our roadmap. So firstly, in our outline this morning, a warning. A warning. Look with me at verse 18, please. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. So if this is the last hour, what should we expect? Well, John says, the Antichrist. Now, when we hear that title, that name, the Antichrist, we conjure up in our minds perhaps scenes from horror movies that we probably shouldn't have watched. Characters with 666 tattooed on them somewhere right across their forehead and a devil incarnate with demonic powers. Just bear in mind, as we read this text this morning, John's readers have never seen a horror movie. Okay? Please just remember that. Let's not try and read our experience back into the text. Their understanding of the term came from what they'd been taught by John and others. As you've heard, he says in the text. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul had been able to teach about the Antichrist or man of lawlessness as he refers to him. And remember, when he was in Thessalonica, he'd only been able to be there for three weeks. Would we think, would I think of teaching about the Antichrist at a basics or a foundations course, a basic doctrine course? I don't think so. But here... Our text tells us that this is what Paul did. We think of the whole concept of Antichrist as slightly weird and maybe even a little bit wacky, to be honest. But for Paul in 2 Thessalonians and for John here, it's part of the understanding of the times that we're in and an understanding not least drawn from the Old Testament, significantly from the prophet Daniel. Daniel described what one of the marks of these last days would be and that people would seek to destroy and deceive the people of God. The last days would be a testing time for the church, a winnowing time, a purifying time. And it seems that this evil opposition would climactically find its expression in an individual. But John here says to us 
that rather than waiting around seeing if you can spot that person who's going to be the Antichrist, we're to realize that, that now already many Antichrists have come. That's his point. It's not something just to worry about in the future. It's something we have to be aware of now, says John. And he tells us, uh, he wants to tell us about them, how to recognize them. Look down in your Bibles at verse 19, please. They went out from us, but they were not of, of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. You see, these antichrists aren't some external threat. They actually come from within. They had belonged, they had been a part of the church professing Jesus as Lord and Christ. Folks, opposition can oftentimes be within our midst, from within our own community of faith, from someone or a group of people who have turned against the community of faith and is out to destroy it. And for the church, certainly, the greatest threat has always been not persecution from the world, but from those within who, as John says in verse 26, would seek to deceive and lead us astray. You see, these antichrists he's talking about don't have eyes that glow red and horns and claws and anything like that. They were probably very lovely, personable, winsome people, respected leaders within the Christian community. They'd once belonged, seemingly. But John says that they'd moved on. They went out from us, verse 19, which means not simply that they left the church and set up new churches whom, whom they were trying to draw people towards. No, rather the us there significantly includes John and the other apostles, their teaching. This is something that John is clear to warn us against in this letter. There are those who want to drive a wedge between Jesus and the apostles. Yes, they still call themselves Christians, but don't accept all that the apostles said. They want to bring in, say, different ideas or more modern ideas about Jesus. And John says, we can't do that. To move away from what the apostles taught is to break fellowship with them and also to break fellowship with Christ. So these antichrists had a wrong attitude toward the apostles. And because of that, a wrong understanding inevitably of Jesus. If you look on to verse 22, please, in your Bibles, it says, Who is the liar but he or she who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he or she, who denies the Father and the Son. Verse 23, no one who denies the Son is the Father, and whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. You see, it particularly seems that they were denying the truth about the Incarnation, denying that Jesus was God in the flesh, fully God, fully man. They didn't accept that. It didn't fit in with the world of that day's thinking, actually any more than it does now. They didn't like the idea of the spiritual on one hand and the material on other coming together. That was a horrible idea to them in their day. The goal was to escape the physical and to become spiritual. The idea of spiritual and physical coming together was abhorrent to them. But the Bible claims that Jesus was fully God and fully man. God incarnate. Hebrews tells us that he was the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of his being. Jesus says elsewhere, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. The world likes to think we can worship God without necessarily accepting everything about Jesus. Spend half an hour on YouTube or on the internet and we can come up with a concept of God. Yeah, that's palatable. That doesn't really challenge me. But John says, John says, that's not the way it works. You can't just have Jesus as a, a good moral teacher, as a guy with a pattern you can follow. He is that. 
But he's much more than that. He is a Savior, a Lord who has come into this world to save us from our sins through his death on the cross, to rise again to give us eternal life, and that he is our Lord and Savior and has claims on our life. And we don't like that in the world that we live in today. They want to tweak Jesus. They want to make him more as we would like him to be. And in doing that, they drive a wedge between himself, between Jesus and the Father. If God is not uniquely and completely revealed to us in Jesus, then what happens is that next we start to tweak our concept of God, to shift the focus away from Jesus and to speak of God in ways that maybe more people might accept. And John is saying that's wrong, that's evil. It bears all the hallmarks of the Antichrist. This is the last hour. We should not be surprised by that. Actually, we're to waken up to that. We're to be prepared for that, to be alert so that we see where people are trying to shift away from what the Scripture says, where we see people trying to shift the focus away from Christ. John is essentially saying that that's demonic. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but I'm just saying what the Bible says. That's demonic. So there's a warning. But as I've alluded to, the tone of the passage isn't really alarmist. He's not trying to frighten us with talk of the Antichrist. What he's saying is more pastoral, more encouraging. And so the second heading this morning, my second point, is a reassurance. There's a warning, yes, but there's also a reassurance. Look down at verse 20, please, in your Bibles. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. Now, you might be picking up what these antichrists, these false teachers, were teaching. Perhaps they were claiming to be anointed in, in some special way, and therefore they had some new insight which the Apostle John and others hadn't had. Sometimes the way the word anointed is, is used by some dear fellow brother and sister Christians suggests that, the, that, that they're, they're, they are those who are special in some way. Man, that, that dude, that dudette, they're really special in some kind of a way. They're clearly anointed. Whereas someone else, by implication, isn't. But John is saying, no, no. But you... And the sense of that you is all of you have been anointed by the Holy One. Every true believer, John is saying, has had an anointing from the Holy One. An anointing, he says, verse 27, that is true and not a lie. You see that? Real, not counterfeit. Perhaps he's having a bit of a dig at these false teachers who were boasting of being anointed. And he's saying, that's the counterfeit anointing. Yours, though, he's saying, it's real. But you might ask, how can we tell if an anointing is real or counterfeit? What's the mark of a real anointing? Well, he goes on to tell us in verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One and you have all knowledge. He kind of goes back to that again in verse 27. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now, very quickly, let me be clear. When John says that you don't need anyone to teach you, He's not saying sack your pastors. Okay? Not saying that. He's not saying do away with mentors. He's not doing, saying do away with disciplers. We need to be mentored. We need uh, to be discipled. We need uh, pastors. I mean, the Bible talks about that office very, very clearly. Why would John say something that would directly contradict that? Makes no sense. When he says that this anointing teaches you all things is that the truth the Spirit teaches us is the truth about Jesus. Okay? 
It's the truth that he says, verse 24, that you heard from the beginning. When the gospel that was preached to them, the Spirit opened their eyes so that they could see who Jesus really was and so that they could understand what he'd done for them on the cross and believe it. Of course, they needed someone to teach the gospel to them. John is not saying that Christians don't need teachers at all. John writes this letter as a teacher to instruct them. In fact, what's going on here, I think anyway, as I was doing my study and my reading, is that what John is doing here is he's trying to to teach people that this is actually a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy back in Jeremiah 31. And it was one of those initial announcements of the new covenant. Jeremiah writes, Jeremiah 31, 33, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother or sister saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. You see, under the new covenant, the covenant that Jesus inaugurated, there is no longer some priestly class who have some special access to the truth. By the Spirit, we can all know God directly and personally. In the gospel, we have heard all that we need to know. It's not some extra knowledge with a few, which a few professionals have access to. And they might pass it on to us if they're so kind. No, that's not it at all. It's all there in the gospel. Jesus Christ came into this world to save us from our sin. Turn away from your sin and turn to him. Of course, we need to understand all the ramifications of the gospel more deeply. And we need teachers to do that. In fact, I'm starting a class Wednesday night in here, 7 o'clock. See you there. But by faith, we already have knowledge of the truth. The Spirit has opened our eyes to help us understand and accept the truth about Jesus. So, as John warns these Christians about the Antichrist, folks who will want to lead them astray, he then goes on to reassure them by saying, it's okay. You have the Spirit. He will keep us. Maybe some of us need to hear the warning part more this morning. Maybe we've become complacent about false teaching. We say to ourselves, well, I go to to Calvary Baptist Church and I sit under the ministry of Pastor Dave and Pastor Paul and Pastor Richard. I'll never be taken in by false teaching. I'm as sound as a pound. I'll never be seduced by that junk. Well, I think we need to waken up and open our eyes wide. Remember, this is the last hour. And we should expect that there will be people who would deceive us. And we need to be on our guard more, perhaps, than we are. Maybe we need to hear that warning this morning. But maybe some of us need to hear that reassurance. Perhaps many of us fear that we could drift Sometimes in our world, we feel our confidence in the truth is very, very shaky indeed. We feel that we could lose our hold on the gospel, but wonderfully, John wants to remind them and us that we have the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing. Listen to these wonderful verses in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 22. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. If we wonder, will I stand firm? Will we stand firm? Yes, we will. Not in our own strength. Rather, Paul says that it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us. He's put his seal of ownership on us. He's claimed us as his own. 
and through the Spirit guarantees what is yet to come. And that's John's reassurance to us too. You have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. Reassurance. But alongside the reassurance, there is also an exhortation, an appeal, an application that he wants them to hear as well. So that's our third heading, an exhortation. Look down in your Bibles at verse 24 of 1 John 2. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, remain in you. And if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. What you've heard from the beginning, that's the gospel which had been preached to them when they came to faith in Christ. He's saying, hold fast onto that gospel. Be aware, there will be pressure to leave it behind, to move on. There will be those who want to lead you astray. But John says, hold fast to that gospel. Now hear me, hear me clearly. It's not just that John's concern is, is, is doctrinal purity. Purity in what we believe. It's much bigger than that. He wants us to hold fast to Christ. You see, the heart of the Christian life is not simply belief in a set of truths. The heart of the Christian life is about a vital living relationship with God. But verse 24 goes on. It says, Then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. The Spirit remains in us. That's the anointing. And John wants us to remain in the Father and in the Son. And that's language of a, a phrase called mutual indwelling. Now, what do I mean by that? It, it, it kind of suggests a relationship with God that is extraordinary. Now, we can talk about relationship with God, but oftentimes it kind of feels like a vague thing, or even it's just a small thing. But however it feels, John would have us know that it is, in fact, an amazing thing, this relationship with God that we have. This language of mutual indwelling is the language used to describe the relationship within the Trinity. The Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father, John writes elsewhere in his Gospel. In human relationships... The most intimate relationship that we know is the marriage relationship, a one fleshness, as the Bible describes it. But actually, this relationship with God is even more intimate than that. The Christian's privilege is to remain in the Son and in the Father, abiding in God and God abiding in us, living in us by his Holy Spirit. It's a relationship that is life-giving and never-ending. Look at verse 25 with me, please. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. That is the essence of eternal life, this relationship with God. Eternal life isn't just uh, quantity. It goes on and on and on forever. It is also quality in the here and the now. When you chose by faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, eternal life began in you. It's not something that starts after you die. It starts the moment that you believe in Christ. That is the essence of eternal life, this relationship with God, a life that is ours now and which we will enjoy fully and forever when this last hour has ended and when Christ appears. And John says, don't move on from the gospel. Make sure it sticks to you. Make sure it goes deeper into you because in that way you will abide in the Father and the Son. One of the, the, the privileges that we have as a pastoral staff is that we have Pastor John Vaudry, who is, it seems to me anyway, a walking church history book. 
And Pastor John constantly comes up with these stories from church history from centuries ago and little quotes, and he puts them on your table, or he says, you've got to read that guy or this gal, and it's just, it just blows your mind what the, the people who have gone before us have actually written. You see, we think because we're modern, we're, we're somehow really smart. We've got it all together. We're discovering it all for ourselves. And that those guys back then, well, you know, they were kind of simple. They weren't really that deeply educated. Well, let me introduce to you this morning an old dead guy by the name and title of the Venerable Bede. You ever heard of him? Old dead guy. And this is what the Venerable Bede, commenting on these verses centuries ago, said, Follow with all your heart that faith and that teaching which you received from the apostles at the beginning of the church, for only this will make you partakers of divine grace. Bede nails it right on the head. That's absolutely perfect. That's what John is saying to us this morning. That is John's call to us here in his exhortation. Hold on to the gospel. Let it remain in you, abide in you, so that you might remain and abide in him. Enjoying fellowship with the Father and with the Son. But when he says these things, it, it kind of gives you the impression that it's not necessarily an automatic thing. John is not saying, look, you've got this anointing now, you're good. There is still effort to be made on our part. Grace is not devoid of effort, Dallas Willard said. There's a carefulness that he's calling us to, to hold on to the gospel, not letting ourselves be drawn away or distracted, not having our focus shifted from the Lord Jesus onto other things and other issues. Beware of that. Because other things and other issues will pull you away from the center that is Christ. Rather, we're to seek to understand the gospel more deeply, hold more firmly to it, and to treasure it more profoundly and wholeheartedly. So can I ask you, as I asked myself this week, Rich, is that what you're doing? Calvary Church family, guests here this morning. Is that what we're doing? Are we doing that? It's rather easy to get a bit stuck, to get a bit blasé about it all, and in fact, a bit bored with the gospel sometimes. But John here tells us that we are to make sure that we see what we've heard from the beginning abides and remains in us us. And we need to be careful about it. We need to be intentional about it. It might be a matter of what we read. Maybe the next book we, should, we pick up shouldn't be that novel. That can wait until the Christmas break or a little long weekend away. Perhaps there's a book that would help you delve deeper into these truths, under, understand them more deeply. Maybe your Bible reading needs a bit of a shake-up. Maybe you're relying on that verse that pings through on your phone each day, which is a lovely thing to take that verse into the day with you. But I suspect that we need to be more careful uh, to make sure that we're rooting ourselves in the scriptures and in the apostolic testimony. Maybe we need some different Bible notes or a different devotional book to help to make sure that what we've heard remains in us. This is the last hour. And so John says, Be warned, many antichrists have come who will want to lead us astray from the Lord Jesus. But don't panic. Don't be alarmed. Because we have an anointing, he says. The Spirit of God wonderfully lives inside of us. Don't panic. Because, but also do not be complacent either. Or naive, rather see that what we've heard from the beginning remains in us. Will we intentionally step forward, brothers and sisters, that week, the week after next, and ensure that these things are so? That's my challenge to you this morning. 
Let us pray and call out to God. Heavenly Father, please help us to keep in mind that indeed this is the last hour. Thank you that that doomsday clock, while whilst it may measure some things, has no bearing on your clock, on your plan for when the Lord Jesus will return. And thank you that he will one day. And may the consciousness of that day make us careful in these times in which we live, discerning in what we watch and listen to and read mindful of the potential from each of us, in a sense, to, to drift away from Christ. We thank you for the gift of your spirit. We thank you that it is you who makes us stand firm. And we pray that indeed you would do that. But help us to play our part too, to be careful and deliberate in making sure that the gospel abides and remains in us, all for Jesus' sake, and all God's people said, Amen.